Morena, everyone. Uh, my name is Bridget Coates. I'm chairperson of Toitu Tahua, the Centre for Sustainable Finance. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our session this morning, uh, Banking on Net Zero. It's a very exciting day for us all, um, stepping forward uh, into the new, what will be a new world. And uh, we're very pleased to have uh, more than 200 people attending this call today from over 70 organizations. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our delivery, event delivery partners, Minter Ellison, Rudd Watts, and the British High Commission. There's an enormous amount of collaboration that has to go into creating this type of event and the broader conversation about reframing the role of banks in Aotearoa's transition. The responsibility that banks have to help their customers reach net zero by 2050, and the opportunities we all have for collective action and for taking leadership noting that this is the, really the first conversation of its kind in Aotearoa. So uh, just to give you a sense of the way it's going to run this morning, uh, first of all, we'll hear from uh, Simone Robbers. Simone is Assistant Governor and General Manager of Governance, Strategy and Sustainability at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and a member of the leadership group here uh, at Toitu Tahua Centre for Sustainable Finance. Simone will then be followed by Dr. Ben Abraham, the COP26 Climate Change Advisor for the British High Commission in Wellington and Senior Advisor at the Climate Change Commission. We'll then look to our moderator, Kate, Kate Lane, a banking and finance partner at Minter Ellison Rudd Watts. Kate has extensive experience advising financiers, borrowers and other market participants across a broad range of areas, from institutional finance to consumer finance. And Kate will then facilitate our discussion with our brilliant panelists, Christian Deskies from HSBC all the way from New York, Grant Nucky from ANZ, Dean Schmidt from BNZ, Christine, Christine Lee from MetLife Care, and Fraser Winaway from Frontera. Thank you all for attending and I'll now pass over to uh, Simone. Thank you. Yeah, go to Katua and thank you, Bridget. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to say a few opening remarks this morning. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So the Reserve Bank has stability at the heart of its mandate. And anything that challenges the stability of our financial system and our economy is our core business. Uh, as a society, reaching net zero by 2050 requires all of us to rethink the way our economy is organised. It's about changing large-scale flows of capital, not just away from the carbon economy, but directing those capital flows into adaptation and to sustainable industries. Our banks and investors have a crucial role to play in mobilising the capital for New Zealand's mitigation of and adaptation of climate change. I acknowledge the leadership shown by our panellists today and the many people within your organisations who have championed these net zero by 2050 commitments and who have dedicated themselves to figuring out how to achieve them. So these commitments are, are an important signal from banks and investors to New Zealand businesses that the time to put in place science-aligned sustainability targets and plans is now. Likewise, with the Reserve Bank as a regulator and supervisor across the financial system and as New Zealand's central bank, the signals we can send on our readiness, our collective understanding of climate-related risks and what we're doing about it are crucially important. Our climate change strategy at the Reserve Bank has three components, getting our own house in order, managing our own climate impacts, mainstreaming climate change across our core functions of monetary policy and financial stability, and lastly, showing the way through leadership. I'll cover briefly three pieces of work under the strategy, our stress testing, supervision and guidance, and then I'll talk briefly about our early thinking on capital risk weights. The stress testing, we're starting to incorporate the risks of climate change in our stress testing and also continuing to improve our, improve our capability in this area. Uh, the plan is to build up gradually over the next year to a full climate change scenario based industry stress test in 2023. And we're already meeting with many of you to start this work. We've begun designing a climate risk assessment of particular loan exposures that are important for financial stability here in New Zealand. So starting with residential mortgages and exposure to coastal flooding due to sea level rise, we plan to discuss this with banks at a workshop in April. 
and later this year we'll plan to run an exercise looking at key risks for agricultural exposures. These exercises are aimed at assessing the resilience of banks' balance sheets to physical and transition risks, identifying gaps in data and modelling, building our collective capability and ultimately helping us all to develop long-term strategies to tr transition to a low emissions future. The second area is just on supervision. Um, supervision is key to delivering on our climate strategy. It's a critical conduit between our regulated entities and the Reserve Bank. Uh, we've been including climate change in our scheduled supervisory engagements with management and boards of banks. And in the coming year, we'll see an uptick in this. Uh, we're also working closely with the XRB and the FMA who are leading on the design and implementation of disclosure obligations and will be supporting regulated firms to get ready for this. Uh, later this year, alongside our COFA agencies, we'll also begin developing a guidance note on climate change risk management for our regulated entities. We'll focus on physical transition and liability risks and we'll cover governance, risk management, scenario analysis and disclosure. The aim is to develop a common understanding of what's needed and share best, best practice. Our planned guidance will be part of this support. On the topic of common understanding, a quick comment on taxonomies. Um, in other jurisdictions, public and private sectors have come together uh, to develop objective, science-aligned system of classifying which activities are sustainable. These systems are called sustainable finance taxonomies, and many of you will be familiar and will be looking at these already. Um, they can help us regulate against greenwashing, they can align government suspend, uh, spending to sustainable activities and enable the private sector to develop green finance products to support the transition. Building this architecture for the financial system is a priority for Toitu Tahua, the Centre for Sustainable Finance. It's a systemic undertaking and requires leadership, engagement and support from all of us. Lastly, on capital risk weights, um, for bank capital, we're often asked whether the Reserve Bank can consider lower capital risk weights for green investment. The short answer is yes, we can. We have to keep in mind that any changes to our prudential capital adequacy framework have to align with our mandate of promoting the soundness and efficiency of the financial system. So in line with other countries, we have a risk-based capital adequacy framework, which many of you will be familiar with, and our capital adequacy rules tend to follow the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision to the global standard setter, but we consider that all relevant risks should be included in our capital, cap, cap, capital cap calculations and risk weights. So ba uh, banks on the internal ratings bank based approach can include green variables in their models now, provided they can demonstrate that these lead to meaningful risk differentiation. One issue, there's obviously a relative scarcity of good data at the moment and information about the impacts of climate change on bank assets, which makes the inclusion in risk estimation difficult, but we are open to the conversation and we know you are all working really hard um, on the information and data. It is a really topical issue within the international regulatory community at the moment. The Bank for International Settlements recently published a paper looking at how frameworks could be modified to more directly incorporate climate risks. So we're staying very connected with this work as it progresses. We'll also continue to talk to industry and to progress our own thinking. So thank you again uh, for the opportunity and also for your courage and your commitment to net zero by 2050. Come handing to Ben. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks, Simon. Tenakotokatoa. It's a pleasure to be here today representing the British High Commission and to be supporting this event. So, firstly, congrats to Toitu Tahua for pulling together an impressive and important event today. I'm also speaking on behalf of the UK COP presidency. COP26 and the Glasgow Climate Pact, while imperfect, were historic achievements that kept the hope of limiting global heating to 1.5 degrees alive through finalizing the Paris Agreement rulebook and driving an uplift in global climate ambition. Net zero commitments have increased from covering just 30% of the global economy when the UK took on the COP presidency to over 90% at COP26. 
including all G7 members, China, and other large emerging economies. This global convergence on net zero has also cascaded from countries to all sectors of the economy. The UN Race to Zero campaign now has commitments to net zero by 2050 and halving emissions by 2030 from over 7,000 companies, 52 subnational regions, 1,100 cities, 1,100 educational institutions, over 500 financial firms. I have to update these numbers every day. That this has occurred despite the global pandemic, despite the best efforts of Trump et al to undermine the global climate regime, shows that the trend towards a net zero world is clear and it is irreversible. The question at hand is now one of speed. The recent IPCC reports have hammered this home, that at 1.1 degrees of current warming, the impacts of climate change are already worse than expected. When it comes to climate change, unfortunately, winning slowly is losing. Still, in the space of a few years, net zero has developed from a niche scientific concept to an aspirational target to regulation in many jurisdictions and is now becoming a global organizing principle for the economy, with criteria and monitoring becoming stronger and more consistent every year. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, GFANS, was launched at COP26 and brings us together for the finance sector. It comprises the leading coalitions of rigorous net zero financial commitments. GFANS members cover 45 countries and are responsible for over 130 trillion US dollars, or 40% of global financial assets. GFAN's commitments must be science-based to reach net zero by 2050, cover all emission scopes, include 2030 interim target settings, and commit to transparent reporting and accounting in line with the race to zero criteria. This is the minimum bar. It will be enforced and it may raise over time. So this is the global backdrop to the event today. And it's great that New Zealand is part of it with several New Zealand members of GFAN's, including the banks here today, ACC, Superfund, and others because the 2020s must be the decade of decisive action. New Zealand, like the world, now has net zero climate commitments in place across the board, but it's time for courageous action and rapid ongoing emissions reductions. Yes, New Zealand has unique national circumstances that need to be taken into account, but it is not unique in having national circumstances, nor in having a responsibility to lead as a developed country taking action through them. So I want to salute the commitments of ANZ, BNZ, and HSBC as members of GFANS, and I'm excited to hear their thoughts today along with those of other participants on how net zero line banking and finance can drive climate action in Aotearoa. So again, on behalf of the British High Commission, the COP Presidency, thank you all for being here, and back to you, Kate. Thanks so much, Ben, and thanks, Simone. Um, that was um, really great to set the scene for the session today. Um, what, what I said, the Toitu Tahua has assembled a really fantastic panel um, to pr provide us insight on the role of banks in supporting a just, just transition of our economy and the world economy. Um, we're going to first have an international perspective on what is, um, of course, a global mission um, from Christian of, um, from HSBC. Um, we're then going to hear from two major New Zealand banks who are here on the ground, ANZ and BNZ, um, to give us a local perspective. Um, and then we're going to hear from two um, major corporates um, in our economy, from Fonterra and MetLife Care, who both have taken a leadership role in sustainability. So um, when we were planning the session, we talked about it as a filter. So we've had the regulatory backdrop, we're going to get an international perspective, and then we're going to drill down for what it means for us in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so that's fantastic. Now, my panel is very illustrious, and we don't have very much time. So um, I do encourage you to um, look up their um, bios. Um, we don't have a chance to share all of their wonderful experience and achievements, um, but I will introduce them all now um, very quickly. Um, first of all, we'll be hearing from Christian De Gliese, and then he's really um, a fantastic part of the international um, movement on net zero. He's the group head of sustainable infrastructure and innovation for HSBC. Um, he's also the co-chair of the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on SDG Investments. He's the co-chair of the Sustainable Infrastructure Working Group of the Sustainable Markets Initiative and the co-lead of working groups of the um, of GFAN. So um, 
you know, we really couldn't have a better person to give that international perspective. So thank you, Christian. I'll just introduce the others and then I will pass over to you. Um, then we have um, Grant Nucky um, talking to us. So Grant is the Chief Risk Officer um, for ANZ New Zealand, um, which I think is really telling that we have both um, the, fr the front line and the risk people talking to us from the banks today. Um, he is also, as well as Chief Risk Officer though, um, has responsibility for um, risk in the Pacific, which is obviously um, um, very critical for, from a climate change perspective. Um, and he has worked in various international roles with the bank for more than 20 years, including um, CEO of ANZ Americas, ANZ Japan and Korea, um, ANZ Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar. So we're very lucky um, to have Grant with us today um, as well. Um, we'll then hear from Dean Schmidt from BNZ. Um, so Dean is um, General Manager of Commercial Services and Responsible Business for BNZ. And, and I think that's a title we might not have had in a major bank um, not very long ago. So that's fantastic. Um, and historically, he's also been Executive General Manager of Corporate Affairs and Transformation for Genesis Energy, who we know are making huge strides in this area. Um, and he's held executive and senior roles with TVNZ, um, Telecom, New Zealand Post, um, in, in corporate affairs, government relations and community relations. So we very much look forward to hearing from you, Dean. Um, and then, then we're going to move to uh, corporate um, um, panelists, so they're the customers of the banks and who will, will be, be feeling the impact um, of this commitment. Um, first of all, we have um, Fraser Winneray. Um, he's the COO of Fonterra, so um, our biggest business. Um, he's responsible for Fonterra's manufacturing site, global supply chain operations, sustainability, innovation, IT and safety, quality and regulatory teams. So he's got a lot on. Um, and many of you will recall that he joined Fonterra from Mercury um, when he where he's CEO from 2014. So Fraser, always you're always a great to hear from. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And then um, lastly, but certainly not least, um, we have Christine Lee, who's the deputy CFO from MetLife Care, um, who's had 15 years experience in audit, financial reporting and commercial leadership. Um, but most recently, and perhaps why, really why she's here today, she's been a key member in a number of strategic projects, including the refinancing of $1.25 billion of debt as a sustainability linked loan, which is an absolutely um, landmark transaction for our uh, markets. So it's great to have you here, Christine, and very much looking forward to hearing from you. So that is our amazing panel. Um, I, I will stop talking and pass over to Christian. And um, welcome to New Zealand, Christian. We very much look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, uh, Kate, and uh, thank you for, for the invitation. It's a great, great pleasure to be joining from, uh, from New York. Uh, that's one of the advantages, I think, of the, uh, of the pandemic. It has been to uh, make uh, the world a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, closer and, and, and tighter. Look, um, a few maybe words of uh, introduction on my, on my side, and I, I think I would like to echo. Uh, what uh, Simone was saying uh, at, at the beginning, that is, I think the, the banks and the financial system in general do have uh, an important uh, responsibility to channel massive amounts of capital that will be uh, needed to, to achieve the transition to, to net zero. And I think the, the task ahead of us is, is pretty daunting. Um, the, the 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 amount of money that has been to that has to be invested to uh, upgrade our um, power system to a great upgrade our transportation system uh, ranges in the uh, tens of billions of trillions of dollars uh, the etc the energy transition commission in the, uh, the uk is estimating for instance that approximately 50 trillion dollars of investments are required across key energy and energy using uh, um, uh, sectors by 2030, uh, that is in eight years time, to put the global economy on a, on a path to uh, uh, low carbon energy systems. Uh, on the renewable side, I think the, the pace of uh, uh, renewable deployment should be uh, multiplied by 10 
uh, in the coming years. And massive investments also need to be made in transporting infrastructure. Think about high-speed rail, for instance, uh, as a substitution for air travel, uh, charging infrastructure for EVs, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's clear that banks have a, a really critical role uh, to play in mobilizing finance and in channeling capital uh, to tilt it away uh, from um, a high carbon economy to something which is going to be aligned with, with uh, net zero. And I think Ben mentioned it during, uh, during his introductory remarks also, uh, the task is only, not only uh, dancing from a, from a level of, of investment point of view, uh, but also it has to take place at a very rapid pace. Uh, this is the, the decade when, when the transformation needs to happen. And uh, if we, the more we wait, uh, the, the more difficult it is going to be uh, to reach the, the targets. I think there are some, some good news, uh, I would say, um, that are contributing to catalyzing uh, finance um, towards, uh, towards net zero and that are accelerating this, uh, this trend. Uh, one of uh, the positive factors is the uh, increased focus from, from regulators, and we could uh, hear that from the uh, Reserve Bank of, uh, of New Zealand. Uh, the other thing, and Ben mentioned it, it's mandates and, and policies coming from the G7, coming from the G20, and to, to that extent, uh, I think Glasgow was a, was a success. So you, you have more and more countries that are mandating, that are setting policy targets to, uh, to move to net zero. Um, I think also, you know, another catalyst will be uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, customers, clients that are that are requiring uh, assistance and help in the transition to, to net zero. Uh, so this is opening, obviously, for banks, important uh, business opportunities that they will that they will want to to capture. So us at HSBC, we we were one of the first ones, I think, to announce uh, um, ambitious climate uh, uh, commitments in the fall. Of, uh, of 2020. Uh, and at that time, we announced uh, three key pillars uh, to, our, to our ambition. The first one is that we would become net zero uh, from an operational point of view by, by 2030. Uh, but more importantly, that uh, our financed emissions would be aligned to net zero by 2050 or sooner uh, at our balance sheet level, so from a global point of view. So that was, I think, the, the headline uh, uh, commitment from us was to announce uh, that our financed uh, emissions portfolio would, would move to net zero. Uh, the second commitment that we made, the second pillar of this uh, commitment was um, the, um, the allocation of up to $1 trillion, between $750 billion and $1 trillion, by 2030 of lending, of facilitation of finance, of investments, in order to help our clients um, move to net zero and to accelerate and to support their own transition to, to net zero. And I think that's you know, this, this uh, proof of commitment from a balance sheet point of view. Uh, from, from, from HSBC and, and from other banks in the financial sector to help clients in the commitment, in their own commitment, in their transition pathways. Uh, and the third pillar of our climate ambition was around unlocking capital for the transition. And this has to do uh, capital that should be channeled, for instance, to sustainable infrastructure, which is a critical part of, uh, of the transition. That 70% of emissions in the world uh, are coming from infrastructure assets. So moving them to something which is going to be aligned with the transition, retrofitting them, developing new uh, infrastructure that will be sustainable sustainable that would be aligned with the transition is absolutely critical, especially in the developing and, and emerging world. So we made this commitment to help unlock capital, and we've been spending a lot of time uh, working with, with um, uh, various industry partners into that. And the other thing on the uh, unlocking capital side, which is important, is nature-based solutions and uh, climate technology. So green hydrogen, for instance, sustainable aviation fuel, direct air capture, all new technologies which will be critical to achieve net zero. So we have a role, a responsibility also to help create new markets and uh, make uh, infrastructure, climate tech, and nature-based solutions new asset classes. 
thank you so much. Thanks so much, Christian. That was um, we we certainly could have a whole session listening um listening to your insights, but that's fantastic. Um, we now bring it back to New Zealand, and and possibly we're not quite um quite as far ahead as HSBC internationally, but Grant, moving to you, when you look at what net zero commitments require of banks, and congratulations for, um, for your um, membership of the Net Zero Banking uh, Alliance. I, I keep wanting to say the New Zealand Bankers Association because of the acronym. Um, and, um, can you talk about what that, those commitments mean to you and, and over the, in the medium to the short term, really, two years, what that will mean for the bank? Sure, um, Marina, everyone. Um, look, what it requires of us first, actually, um, which might sound like an odd thing to say, is is um, some humility. Um, and I'll explain, because I think inevitably there's a, a certain amount of cynicism um, with uh, banks pontificating, um, you know, on carbon transition. Um, and there's a good reason for that. You know, we, we were part of the system that got us where we, we are today. Um, and and with, with humility, I think acknowledging that and acknowledging that we've got a lot of work ahead of us and a lot to learn. Um, and here's an opportunity to be part of, of the remedy um, and contribute to what I think is, is really a self-reinforcing system in the, in the area of carbon transition. Um, and if you think about it from a systemic viewpoint, compliance and, and incentives have a role to play um, alongside opportunity. Um, and I know we want to focus on opportunity, but you know, the fact is something like um, the disclosure obligations that the New Zealand government um, are bringing to bear are a really important accelerant. And, and we know how important PACE is here. Um, it's a really important accelerant and a key part of the system that will develop in New Zealand that's going to support these net zero commitments. Um, so I look at the Net Zero um, Banking Alliance as you know, another key part of that self-reinforcing system. Um, you know, what, what does it require? It requires a signatory like us to uh, make a commitment, outline a credible plan uh, to net zero by 2050 or sooner um, uh, for the emissions profile of our loan books uh, and our investments. Um, but acknowledging that some way off, um, we need to set intermediate targets from 2030 in five year steps. Um, so, so this is a strategic driver. It's a decision shaper um, and, and a system within, within a broader system, as I see it, of you know, mechanisms that reinforce each other. And I think that point is really critical. Um, you know, let's face it, if, if you want change, whether it's personal or organizational, just setting a goal um, won't actually get you anywhere. Uh, you need a system of plans and incentives and frankly, sometimes obligations. Um, uh, so maybe just to address the second part of your question, Kate, um, you know, what, what are we doing specifically over the next couple of years uh, with that in mind. Um, the, the, the practical requirement is that we can measure and, and monitor the emissions profile of both ourselves, but more importantly, our customers. Um, and there's a lot of work uh, to build that capability and that data set uh, in, in New Zealand. Um, then, of course, on the opportunity side, uh, it, it is about first helping our customers plan their own transition um, and uh, identify you know, the nature of those risks and then financing uh, that, that transition. And with an ANZ over the next three years, we've set a $50 billion um, funding target uh, in the area of sustainable and transition finance. And we're starting uh, with a bit of focused work on the, the top emitters in, in that profile. Um, so, Kate, I'll, I'll stop there, just conscious of time. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Grant. Um, that um, it's it's fantastic to hear about ANZ's tangible um, commitment to this, which is um, what we what I think your customers are looking for, which is fantastic. And Dean, I know that VNZ um, is similarly have has some great commitments in this area. 
Um, from your perspective, how do these commitments, these net zero commitments extend beyond your mandatory climate related financial disclosures that will obviously come into effect in 2023? Is it more than that for you? Yeah, it's a really good question, Kate, and kia ora to everybody. You know, TCFD, it's really just the data that you need to, to provide us the building block to meet the commitments that we're trying to strive for with net zero. So I think about TCFD is, is more about the understanding of what we've got to do. And then, of course, then there's the net zero, which is actually about the doing. So, you know, we do have some real heavy lifting to do over the next couple of years around, you know, gathering the data that we need um, for both the mandatory reporting, of course, but also so we can get a clear understanding of, of what's in our books and more importantly, what our customers are doing. So, um, you know, many of our large customers, as Grant's highlighted, we've already started on a lot of this journey um, to develop transition plans. And of course, you know, we're, we're developing our own, our own transition plan. I think over and above where TCFD reporting and, and getting that baseline data is, is, is really we're thinking about it in sort of three buckets, just like it seems to be everyone has the three core things. You know, firstly, we've got to encourage customers. There's a real cultural change that has to happen. And um, and I think Grant highlighted, you know, this is a learning experience for banks as much as, as anything. Um, and there's a cultural change in both the finance sector and in the sectors in which, in which we participate. So, you know, there's real encouragement piece. This is not for us that we're, we see ourselves as a transition bank. And I think um, that means that, you know, this is not about just a hard exit of customers in New Zealand. Um, it needs to be sensible and working with those customers on transition plans um, and is going to be key to how we're going to manage this through for New Zealand. I think the second core piece for us is, is, is really about educating and providing tools. Um, you know, New Zealand has a lot of SMEs um, in every supply chain um, and, and all of us as, as corporates will need to understand what our, what our SME um, customers and clients and participants in our supply chains are doing. Um, so, you know, we're really setting on a bit of a journey to um, understand what SME's impact in New Zealand looks like and how we can encourage them to start thinking about a net zero future as, as much as we are um, larger customers. So I think, you know, developing things like the Climate Action Toolbox and, and other things and other tools and educational um, outreach to people that probably have been waiting for um, big companies to move first um, is really key over the next you know, five years. Um, and I guess lastly for us, it's the same. It's, it's, it's products, it's financing, it's really working with um, customers to figure out what those next steps look like and how we can help finance that journey, which we'll, we'll hear about from um, some of our corporate clients in a minute. Um, so look, you know, TCFD over and above to net zero from TCFD, you know, we need TCFD to make sure that we understand the baseline from which we're operating. Um, without that, you know, it is a bit, uh, it's a bit operating without any understanding. So um, that, that's probably just the core of it, Kate. Thanks so much, Dean. Um, that, that's, um, that's really great. And I think that's right, isn't it? What, what, this is where the rubber hits the road rather than um, just, um, you know, aggregating data, which is um, really where we need to be. Um, so Fraser, we'll move, move to you now. So you're obviously a business customer and um, I expect of, um, of all these banks that we have before you. What, what do the bank's commitments um, to net zero, what do they signal to you, Bonterra, yeah, well, kia ora tato. Very positive to see the banks deeply involved in this and certainly commend the Centre for Sustainable Finance and its co-papa here and its mahi. So banks are critical at pricing risk. They do so very accurately uh, for good reason, for their own sustainability. And debt, debt capital markets are far more widespread in economies than listed equity capital markets. And of course, beyond lending is also the critical insurance market. So um, by them pricing these risks more accurately, uh, it will help the economy focus on what is real and reduce greenwashing because whether people are in businesses or in government there's a there's a habit to move towards things that sound good but they don't actually shift the bar and so I'm sure banks will be very sophisticated in their thinking about this and their pricing of risk 
Turning to Fonterra, um, yeah, we've committed to net zero end to end uh, in the value chain by 2050. You know, we're trying to make sure we're marrying up the demands and the very different ones across the world of, of customers in 120 countries with 9,000 farmers who look after the two most fundamental biological processes that underpin our co-op, which is growing the food for the cows and then looking after the well-being of those cows as they produce that uh, into milk. The bulk of the debt that we have actually as a cooperative, if we're thinking Tato Tato is on farm, um, and we're very pleased to see the banks wanting to see the farm environmental plans. It's up to about 55% now of our farms have farm environmental plans, uh, which are reviewed annually. Uh, that will be complete by 2025. Um, and in those, they get individual annual carbon statements. They also get individual nitrogen statements. Um, so the carbon position on farm is actually world leading, but we've got to do more, not only for the environment, obviously, uh, but also to maintain relative competitive advantage because it's a good time to be a producer of low carbon food. And particularly the, the lower you can make that carbon, that's, that's, that's great for sustainable business. Off farm, we still have eight, eight sites. Um, uh, which use coal out of 27, that's falling. Uh, we've been onto that journey for some time. 76 gas type appliances, four co-generation plants in partnership, 500 trucks traveling 100 million Ks a year and 2.6 million tons goes overseas on ships. And that adds up to quite a lot. Um, it's not as much as the on-farm stuff, but it does add up to quite a lot um, and is almost half as much of as the national airliners here in New Zealand. So um, all of those fuel systems off farm either have gross or net zero plans in place and they're well underway. Uh, we've also got a full size electric tanker uh, getting built right now uh, to show that the heavy end of uh, transport can get in this game as well. So my encouragement to banks is price it properly, use markets, use existing reporting standards and templates wherever possible and be very careful of avoiding greenwashing and or thinking that New Zealand just has its own atmosphere. It doesn't. This is a global issue and we need to make sure we focus on global outcomes, including um, well-being of people and a broad set of UN development goals. Thanks very much, Kate. Thanks, Fraser. And I, and I think um, uh, Grant mentioned that the, um, the benefit of obligations in um, in making sure people do the right thing. And then the other thing I guess is the power of the customer. So I think it is wonderful um, to yeah. hear such an important customer, um, you know, really crystallizing why this is so important. Um, um, so speaking of important customers, uh, uh, Christine, we'll now move on to you and thanks Fraser. Um, now, what would be great to hear from you is what's changed for you in the last 12 months in the sustainability conversations you've been having with your banks and, and your investors and, um, and what has this meant at a practical level for, for your business? Sure. Um, thanks, Kate, and morning, everyone. Um, so to just to answer your question, Kate, I thought uh, I would share Matt Lakeer's story and the sustainability journey that we've been on over the last um, 12 to 18 months. So Matt Lakeer's commitment to sustainability has really taken off since EQT's acquisition of the company about 18 months ago. So for those who don't uh, know, EQT is one of the largest global PE firms based in Sweden and sustainability is core to their business model and really integral to their investment decisions. And they were also the first PE firm uh, to set science-based targets and mandating their um, portfolio companies to also commit to the same initiatives. So in keeping with the strong sustainability values of our owner, Medlife Care has fully embedded sustainability in our five-year growth strategy. Um, and so, so sustainability is really embedded in everyday business decisions. Um, it influences decisions from which building materials we want to use uh, in constructing our next um, new retirement villages to which suppliers we want to do a business with. So while um, our sustainability journey, I guess, has been relatively short, the reason why we were able to get going really quickly and really seriously is because we had a clear mandate from our owner, which cascaded down to the board level and the CEO level, so the tone at the top. Our commitment um, to sustainability also extended to how we finance uh, our business. 
So in December last year, we completed New Zealand's largest sustainability linked loan, which um, sets annual performance targets for three material sustainability KPIs. I think this is a really good example of how the banks can work with their customers to incentivize their transition to net zero and raise collective ambition towards um, bigger sustainability targets. So our sustainability uh, coordinators uh, played an important role during the refinance to challenge us to set more ambitious targets and address um, important issues that are relevant to our business, but also very important um, to our communities in New Zealand. They were also able to share some external perspectives and how others are tackling some of the practical issues we were facing, which was hugely valuable to us um, who had recently started that um, journey. And the loan um, structure obviously offers some financial incentives for meeting our targets and equally uh, penalizes uh, for missing the targets. But it most importantly demonstrates um, or signals our collective commitment towards sustainable financing and investment to the market, and hopefully one that encourages others to, to join. And my last comment is, uh, uh, is that a lot of the uh, focus to date has been on the environmental issues, but we can't overlook other components of um, sustainability and lose sight of the social issues while we're making uh, changes to address the environment. So this is also why our sustainability strategy encompasses material issues in relation to the environment, but also social and governance. So all aspects of ESG um, are well covered. So the key points here are that we, are, we have significantly changed our posture in ESG over the last 12 months. And because we understand the urgency of the issue and how ESG has become the expectation from the shareholders. I think the banks have a, a really critical role to play here as they can help their customers transition to net zero and take a step further, really influence the customers to set more ambitious targets and hold them accountable uh, via uh, sustainable financing uh, products such as sustainable linked loan. So that's all I wanted to share today and thanks for listening. Well, thanks so much, Christine. I mean, that, that's such um, an inspiring story given the urgency of the challenge that you've been able to you know, pivot so very quickly um, and nothing like, um, an investor with a commitment of that nature to really um, get you to work. So that's um, really great. Now, I might, if I could ask the other panelists now to turn your cameras and um, microphones on. Um, we have, um, we slightly overshot in terms of time, but I didn't, this, the discussion was so good, I didn't want to stop you. But um, so we, we've got a, a bit of time for some questions though. Um, the first, um, I, th I think the first thing is that if you think of our audience today, which is um, New other New Zealand banks, uh, your own banks, New Zealand corporates, and everybody interested in um, markets in New Zealand, can, can, you can you think about what the key learnings that you have in, um, in really very recently, in the last six months, about what's required to make these net zero commitments? and where you would, I guess, commend people to um, expend their efforts. And, um, and Grant, because you were so kind as to wrap up quite quickly, I will let you go first, if that's all right. There you go, there's a benefit. Um, look, so for me, um, pr probably the biggest lesson of the last six months is, is about data. I mentioned that when I spoke earlier, but um, you, you must have the old chestnut, you know, what gets, um, measured gets managed um, and, and you you need a reliable New Zealand data set um, around uh, you know, emissions profiles and, and the physical and transition risks. That data, as we're finding out, is not easy to put together, um, but we are in some cases in a relatively good and better position if I compare the conversations I have with colleagues in Australia, for example, um, uh, and and Fraser mentioned earlier um, from a from an ag perspective, New Zealand is actually in a, in a you know world class position uh, from you know the the data that's already available. But that is that's the key. Um, ideally, alongside that, you need to get agreement on methodologies um, to get industry alignment. 
and we don't yet have that. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point, and I guess that's that's the role of um, the centre to some degree, um, which um, is a challenge that they've taken up. Um, Christian, you're, you're perhaps at a slightly different point in the journey than the other panelists. So, what what's been your hot buttons in the last uh, six months? In the last six months, so if you go back about six months ago, it was it was Glasgow. Uh, it's almost six months ago now, and uh, I think there was a lot of excitement uh, at Glasgow. A lot of commitments made by uh, uh, businesses, by financial institutions, uh, and and that was uplifting. That was really good. But in order to avoid some, you know, I think Fraser mentioned greenwashing and and commitments that don't turn into reality. So I think you know we we need to turn those commitments into deliver deliverables and into uh, into uh, things which will which will really change the, the banks from our point of view. Uh, so in the last few months, we've uh, published uh, new science-based targets uh, and interim targets for uh, for for some of our high carbon sectors. So for coal, for instance, for uh, uh, thermal coal, we uh, uh, announced that we would be phasing out uh, all financing by 2030 in the OECD and by 2040. Uh, in uh, outside of the OECD uh, in the emerging and, and developing world. We've also announced some new uh, science-based targets and interim targets for oil and gas, so to reduce uh, our portfolio of financed emissions in the oil and gas uh, sector by 34% uh, uh, by 2030 from, from a baseline in, in 2019. So something which is aligned again with the uh, 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 science-based targets. Um, and same thing in the power and utility sector, we've uh, announced that we will be reducing the uh, uh, intensity of financed emission by 75% uh, by 2030. So, so real commitments that will need a significant change within the bank and working with uh, customers, which is critical, uh, reviewing their transition plan, helping them meet their transition plan, using some new instruments, like Christine was saying, um, uh, sustainability linked bonds, sustainability linked uh, loans, to help them uh, and incentivize them in the process of transition. Great, thank you, thank you, Christian. And then, um, perhaps, Dean, if if we might go to you ne next. And one of the things we certainly would be interested in understanding, um, as well as your ch challenges in the in the last six months, is with is any tips on how we galvanise the commitment of the business community, you know, to to this work. Yeah, look, it's. Uh, I mentioned sort of maturity and um, as we go through this and attain changing cultural behaviours across multiple sectors and you know we've we've got two people here who are clearly a lot along further along on that journey than than a lot of others and I think over the last six months the real focus outside of data is actually just the amount of information we're going to require from businesses as as banks um, and you know, it's sort of KYC on steroids, if you want to think of it like that. And I think you know that resistance potentially from people who don't really understand their businesses, we need to get in behind them to help them actually come along with us. Um, there's still a number of organisations, and a lot of them are smaller, to be fair, who just who just aren't really seeing their participatory role here. They're waiting for the big companies the Fonterras of the world to make the big moves and they don't see their role just yet. And we need to encourage them along that. And that's part of the collaboration of this, this, this group and but also you know, where we need to um, collaborate across with government and others to really start driving this education um, that we actually don't have much time. Um, and you know, when, as we go through for TCF data and acquiring that data, they're gonna to have to understand why and that can't just be left up to the banks to tell them why they need to have a transition plan. That, that's um that's great. I think that I mean that this leadership um is just so important, isn't it? And and Fraser, I think often um when people talk about leadership, people do turn to Fonterra um, given your significance in the economy. Um, I mean, in terms, I, I guess of of how you are leading, you're leading on farm, but um is is there is there more you are doing across the economy? Yeah, there's a lot, and, and in many instances, Kate. Um, uh, some of the things are done in partnership with others. I mean, there's there's plenty of great stuff going on 
uh, which Fonterra learns from in the New Zealand New Zealand situation as well. But quite often with our scale, what we can do here is help break the ice, the chicken and egg, you know, so, you know, long dated contracts from an A minus credit actually then help underwrite capital, uh, such as the Nature's Flame biopallet plant, which then substituted coal at Tiamudu and dropped our coal use by 10%. I mean, that was the largest decarbonisation project in New Zealand last year. But um, you know, you'd think plastic keep cups were the amount of airtime they tend to get in terms of businesses' activity. So, um, so it's 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 really important uh, that and and the the Centre for Sustainable Finance's gestation came from a great bit of work from the Sustainable Finance Forum, which was put together by the Aotearoa Circle. And at the Aotearoa Circle, it was about getting to the bottom of the big things in each of the pillars of capital, natural capital to prevent their decline. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you do them first because it might be that there's further R&D and things to go, but it means that you do know what they are and work with government and private sector on that because, um, and to do that, you actually have to get the maths right first. Um, and you need to do the maths before you write the memes. And quite often in sustainability, it goes the other way around. And, and therefore we do a whole bunch of stuff, uh, which, you know, the, the, the world does this, uh, a whole bunch of stuff, which is, um, uh, doesn't actually make a zack of difference. In fact, quite often it can send the planet into a worse place. Uh, so if we do agree that we've got limited time, limited capital and limited resources to solve this, we really do need to make sure we're getting the best bang for buck in terms of tackling uh, emissions. And so re that's why I'm delighted to see the banks in this, um, because it's it, they got a pricing risk and they should take the emotion out of it and really get to the bottom of of um, of uh, the maths before um, we all get carried away with you know sort of well-meaning but potentially damaging marketing. Yeah. Thanks, Fraser. That's um that's a good challenge to all of us. It it can be hard to take the emotion out of um something so emotional but um, uh, um but you make some you make some good points um um christine um if we um if we turn to you i think we we um what would maybe if i ask you a bit about your co collaborators so you've obviously been on this big urgent journey as a result of um your investor um and and who who would you say has been key um to your ability to do that what who the collaborators in the sector or the leadership that's been shown by others um i, I think this is uh one that kind of requires close collaboration from your customers to your suppliers to your um your uh investors and bankers and yeah it's a whole ecosystem because if you think about a company that's trying to reduce its carbon emissions you have to they'll have to collaborate with the suppliers to reduce you know potentially the upstream emissions to change the nature of the inputs they use and if you're looking to adjust your downstream emissions you know you'll have to make a sort of clear case to your customers for why a green product is a better product than a tra traditional product so um and and also if you're to make investments in physical assets you know you'll need to engage with your uh, banks and the investors so i think it's really important to recognize that unlike um, any other business decisions, uh, the net zero transition is one that requires engagement with external stakeholders. Um, and we also undertook our uh, materiality assessment last year, engaging with 42 individuals from eight internal and external stakeholder groups, including our banks. Um, and we've discussed with them, you know, the material issues and topics um, that are relevant to our business, but also what's really going to move the dial. Uh, in this net zero transition and, and um, that could impact the, the wider community. Um, and that was uh, a really good exercise to really align our objectives and, and priorities. So to un in, in short, everyone. <laughs> in short, everyone. But I, well, I actually think that there's, um, that, <laughs> that's actually probably quite um, a good place to close. But since we do have five minutes, um, I, I might just invite, because which is going, of course, entirely off piece. Um, so sorry, panelists. If you had um, one thing you'd like to leave the audience uh, with from today, um, and and Simone, I would invite you to um, invite you to comment here as well, if that's all right. Um, what would that be? And Simone, I'll start with you since I um, since I mentioned you. 
Oh, you might be mute. Yep. Thank you, Kate. Uh, look, I mean, we've heard a lot about data. We've heard a lot about us all learning, beginning, helping our customers. So uh, it's it's been said a lot before, but just collaboration. Um, this is like no other um, challenge that we've had before. So we need to do this together. So that would be my one thing. Excellent. Thank you. And and um, Christine, what, um, maybe we'll go to you next, if that's all right. Um, sure, I think Simone might have stolen uh, <laughs> my thunder there, but um, yeah, no, I, I just echo what she just said, and um, I think also um, Fraser's point earlier that uh, we need to do something better than greenwashing. Obviously, uh, there are easier way, ways to kind of, you know, show that the companies are doing something, you know, and that, that may not uh, be the real issues uh, that might move the dial, and we don't actually have a lot of time if we wanted to get to a certain place by 2030 uh, and, and beyond. So we need to really act now with, with a sense of urgency. And, and, and I think um, the banks and everyone here today can play a huge role there. So yeah, feel the sense of responsibility and, and let's work together. Thank you. Thank you. And then Dean, what about you? Um, mine's pretty simple, really. It's, you know, we want customers to start having the conversation with us early. Um, and you know that's how we'll get progress quickly. So we need a two-way communication channel really early with our customers about what their ambitions look like and how we can help them get there. Um, because without that, if we come in too late, you know it just delays everything. So earlier engagement, the better. Excellent. And um, Grant. Thank you. Yeah. Look, I'll come back to what I said earlier. I think it's it's all about the system um, and that, you know, to take a cue from Fraser before that, you know, the system's not driven by benevolence, it's driven by practicality and, and data and stakeholders, you know, mutually reinforcing each other towards an outcome. I think that's really important. And Fraser. Second one for me. Yeah, uh, thanks, Kate. Oh, um, is that the second one for you? Uh, no, did uh, I give you a second? No, 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 no. No. Oh, no I'm, I'm, I haven't had a go yet, but I'll give it a shot. Um, <laughs> I thought you were saying I've done the double. No, no, I was just making sure I was mute. Um, look, I think it's what my advice to the leaders is work out the big items, um, disclose and explain those. That's coming up through reporting standards anyway. Um, and then talk about those because leadership isn't about holding up a mirror to a population and just asking them what's intuitive to them because they're busy doing their things and they don't necessarily have the privileged view of all this information and data that's available to us. So we need to bring them on the journey because otherwise um, governments and organisations will continue to poll what a population thinks and do that, which actually, if you map what a population's intuitive intuition is versus actually what's required for this journey, there's not a lot of overlap. That's the issue. Great, thank you. And then, Christian. Lastly, uh, from our international guest, and thank you. Um, what? Um, any last words for us here in New Zealand? Well, it's it's really difficult Kate, to come up with uh, something new after all what has been said. You know, customer engagement, collaboration, all that is critical. Uh, a couple of things I will mention, and and the, the issue of uh, uh, social and and just transition, uh, I think was raised before. I think it's it's critical uh, if it is going to be uh, successful. It has to be uh, integrate a, a social element to it. So it's not only about energy transition, but it's also about a, a just transition. Um, the second thing I would like to, to mention uh, is the role of technology also, because we are at a point now where we know it's going to be challenging and we need to develop new technologies, whether it's direct air capture, whether it is um, you know, sustainable aviation fuel, green hydrogen and others. So we do also have a role in the financial system to, to create, to reduce that green premium and to, uh, and to make those technologies more, more widely available because they will be critical to the transition. Thank you. Thank you. What an excellent note to um, end on. And thank you to all the panel panelists for what was absolutely a fantastic session. Um, um, notwithstanding the challenges of data, the urgency of the challenge and the challenges of pricing risk, um, I for one feel very hopeful for our net zero goals coming out of that. Um, I don't know that I've often heard banks talk about humility it was great to hear banks recognize the benefits of um, obligation. 
Um, it was wonderful to hear people talk about their role as leaders of cultural and structural change in our economy. Um, and of course, um, to the stick, I guess, to hear bank customers demand authentic, practical, data-driven action. And so um, I hope that um, leaves people people buoyed about um, our, our progress to net zero. Um, and um, of course, um, I hope it leaves people in no doubt as to the urgency of this challenge. So thank you all for um, joining us today. Thank you to our panelists and, and thank you um, to uh, the centre for facilitating what well, was a great discussion.